Alright, well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to the seventh session of uh, Bola Chali, uh, organized by my voice and heart. Um, my voice and heart is uh, a digital media project, and we are focusing on highlighting invisible narratives in our society to break the stereotypes about Pakistanis all around the world. And today, in the seventh episode, we have Mr. Shah Nawaz Reddy. Uh, who is a renowned artist, uh, a painter, an actor, a poet, a singer, a writer, <laughs> and um, and he's uh, for all his work he's been uh, decorated with uh, presidential awards such as Tampai uh, Tiaz in arts and uh, the Pride of Performance in Art Education. And with that background, I want to start this conversation and really ask you, who is this man, Shah Nawaz Zedi? Oh my God, you're supposed to start with some easier question, isn't no. it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think uh, this is, uh, without being humble uh, at all, a very ordinary person. Uh, in the sense that I have never been outstanding in my school or college or any time in my life, actually, perhaps. But um, uh, basically, I think uh, creativity is my strength, that I am not a conformist, that I questioned and I uh, was not satisfied, never satisfied with the answers which were provided beforehand. So I looked for my own ways and tried to do what, whatever I could. All right, we'll get back to those ways. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but before we go to words, that part, uh, I want to go out to your childhood. And um, I want to ask you what's the fondest memory you have from your childhood and uh, what was your childhood like? Well, I, th I think my childhood was uh, very ordinary. In the sense? Um, in the sense that my parents actually migrated from India. They were from uh, Muzaffarabad, Muzaffarnagar in Meerut, somewhere near, in, in UP. And uh, after the partition, they, they migrated to Pakistan. Uh, I think after after a couple of years, not at the same time. And for some funny reason, they settled in uh, Mandi Bhavdin. Mandi Bhavdin is now quite a city, but at that time it was it was a small town, a very small town. And uh, we lived there for I think about ten, twelve years. All my uh, childhood was spent there. That is. And we were, uh, at that time, we were, I think, perhaps six or seven brothers and sisters, but we are actually 11. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, even today, I mean, we're 11 of us are there, mashallah. Mashallah. And um, uh, my early education was, uh, first of all, uh, because of that cultural shock, because of the fact that coming from totally different background, coming to uh, this small town and getting a house where in front of the house there was, a, you know, two buffaloes were standing there and there was hardly space for somebody to really cross that lane you know, without <laughs> yeah. rubbing against them or something. So, um, um, my parents decided that we are not going to go to school, at least the early part of it. So for the first five classes, four classes, we were at home. Uh, and because we were a number of us, um, at that time there were three sisters and three brothers. So, and there was, there was some space in the, in the house, there was a courtyard where we would play. And uh, one of the, one private teacher used to come, a, a tutor, to teach us who was from the same school. And whenever he wanted, he would say, uh, you are promoted to the next class. There was, <laughs> there was no exam or anything like that. And uh, in, in class five, 
then we were admitted to the school. So there was no early kind of, you know, early education or preschool and all those fancy things. Um, and when we went to the school, it was, the school was a, what, what we call a tart school. Yeah. That we used to have these mats and we would have to just dust them ourselves and uh, put the mats there. Um, and then we would, you know, start studying. So, um, in a way, uh, I don't have any such thing to narrate, like I was in the company of these scholars, or I was, I was taught by these great teachers, or something like that. Nothing of that sort actually was there. And sometimes I wonder, uh, what was it? Because not myself, I'm, I'm not talking about myself, but my eldest sister, for example, Arjuman Shaheen was a very famous newscaster, one of the earliest ones. And so was the uh, other one, which was um, Yasmin Vasti. And then my third Entire sister. Family, actually. Then my third sister, <laughs> she was, <coughs> sorry, she retired as an outstanding professor of chemistry. And my brother, my younger brother, is, uh, is an actor very well known. And I mean, two of my other brothers and sisters are poets. And one of uh, my younger sister is a very known painter. So I, I sometimes wonder that coming from a very humble kind of a beginning, uh, where my parents were, my mother, for, for example, had never gone to school. Um, she could read and write, and she was interested very much in uh, studying, but she never had formal education. And my father, he was educated in, in Aligarh at that time, doing a BA from Aligarh was considered to be quite something. But he had no time for us, frankly. And uh, because it was a big family, and because my uncle and his children were also living with us, kind of, you know. So um, uh, he hardly had any time to tutor us or tell us anything. Sometimes he would just be passing from us, from there, and he would ask, uh, class mein pad rahe aap? In which class are you studying these days? <laughs> to one of the one of us. And we would say, in eighth class or something. <laughs> and he would say, okay, okay, fine. And he would go his own way. You know, so I think that, that liberty also, and the fact that we were not pressurized to top in the class, to be the first, to be ahead of everyone, there was no such thing. Yeah. There was no colonization kind of yes. influence on your early education. And we were totally what you call avara gardh, you know, <laughs> especially the boys were. We would go out in the fields and sometimes just there used to be these berries, which we call berry, you know, and we would just, you know, throw stones on them and collect them and play all sorts of games in the street like gulli danda and, you know, like kabaddi and there was so many so many th like those uh, you, you things you play with your uh, what do you call it um, they're called but, uh, marbles all sorts of uh, funny games whatever are played in the in the villages we would be there involved in it and just passing the class would be enough for us yes. it was never there was no pressure of any kind. That's amazing. So I think that that was something really that helped a great deal because these days we are we don't trust our children. We don't let them be themselves. I mean, a child comes from school and then he is driven to the academy and he is then studying there and then he is you know too dead tired and he doesn't have time and he just maybe is allowed to watch TV for half an hour, cartoon or something, and then he goes to sleep. Absolutely no life, and the pressure is too much. Phones, iPads, phones. Yes, yes, that too. So, um, in a way, this uh, this childhood was very interesting. But there, there's no one specific event that I can really, really put my finger on and say that this was the most fabulous or fantastic thing that that happened. There were some uh, incidents, particularly related, related to art. There was one incident. Um, 
going to ask you this question. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. But before that, you tell me, uh, who were you close to, your mother or father, and why? Well, father for us was uh, basically a figure to, uh, to be afraid of. I mean, because uh. I think managing so many children for my mother must have been a very difficult task. I can understand it now. And uh, she would just make us scared of him. Wo aagaye, mother, he says, come there. Mm -hmm. and was, you know, and we were not even allowed to listen to radio or anything of that sort when he's there. Was, although he was a very kind person and not at all uh, that type. But uh, we were always under this awe of his, his presence and we, we would hide here and there and, you know, just right. try to disappear. So with father, we had hardly any connection. Even when I grew up, even now, I mean, recently when he passed away, up to that time, I was not able to be frank with him or to, you know, say anything to him. I've, this hindrance always stayed there, unfortunately. And that is why I thought that with my children, I'm going to be like a very close friend. And I tried to do that. But I think overall, his, the influence of his personality, because he was quite a creative person himself. Uh, and he could do many things which were, uh, we were creative. He was a good photographer and he had a lot of equipment, camera, the old type, you know, in which you put this curtain on you and you, you know, that sort of, a, yeah, those, those, those kind of things he would do. And make small, small things with the uh, reed, you know, for us to play and things like that. So I think that he, he was a very creative person. But in his own work and because he had to make a living and uh, we were too many of us, so mm -hmm. we hardly had any interaction with him. With the mother, of course, everybody has uh, interaction with the mother. But I was personally, I think, uh, not really very much attached even to my mother. The, the, the sisters were, they remained till the end very, very close and, you know, sharing everything with her. But I was a little, you know, hesitant, hesitant <laughs> <laughs> even in that. Okay. All right. So, um, as a teenager, did you en envision yourself um, the same way that you are right now? Or did you have other plans, like, you know, always parents would pressurize or have expectations that, you know, you'll be a doctor or an engineer. So, did you have that? Or did you had always envision yourself? Well, I, I think I was always a dreamer. I, I, I've always been. Uh, not a very practical person, unfortunately, but um, uh, very sensitive. And I remember that when I was a, when I was very young, then I would cry almost at everything and hide somewhere. And I'm thinking in my mind, yeah, these my these parents of mine are not maybe the real parents. Of, <laughs> you know, uh, such thoughts would come to my mind, and uh, I was extremely o overly sensitive. But, of course, uh, art was not uh, anything at that time because in the school there was no encouragement for art. Although we used to have a subject of drawing, but that was later on. Uh, I remember that in the school, when I, was, when I went to the fifth class, I, I was good at drawing even at that time. So I, I used to draw some faces, maybe faces of some actresses or whatever I saw in some of the magazines, copy them or something. And I once drew in my um, book, which was supposed to be, I think it was some maths or something else, something like that. And the teacher was checking the homework and when he yeah. checked and he saw that, he really flew into a rage and he said, what the hell, you, you know, spoiled the whole book. And he told me to become a murga. <laughs> and uh, I, that was the first time. And, I, uh, and he, then he kicked me. On my, I'm rolling down there, you know, f banging against that wall. And then he tells me again to do that. And he gave me hell of a punishment for making those drawings. But of course, I mean, 
I never gave it up. I just continued with it. Right. And uh, like every other male, I think, boy at that time, either we could be an engineer or a doctor, nothing. I think there was hardly a third yeah. choice. There was no third choice at that time. So I was also, I, I did my FSC in pre-medical. And uh, when I told my father after that, luckily I didn't had didn't have enough marks also to take admission in medical. Otherwise, I would have been a pathetic doctor today. <laughs> but uh, you'd be so creative <laughs> <laughs> with the surgeries. <laughs> yes, I would be crying with the, every patient. And um, so when when I told him that I want to do art, my father was a I mean, he was a very liberal person, but he was shocked. And he said, after that, what are you going to do? Are you going to paint these boards of the cinemas or something like that? Because that was the thing that the painters used to do at that time. And um, but I said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but this is what I want to do. And he said, OK, do what you feel is good for you. So I went to the university, I appeared in that test, I was very good at it. And then I'm, I mean, that was not something that I really worked very hard for. It was just there in me. I, mean, I cannot take any credit for it, in unfortunately. You. It was embedded in you. <laughs> <laughs> so, coming back to your childhood. So, um, was there any incident or any, any person who influenced you in a way that has uh, um, impacted your work? And now you can answer what you were saying, that thing about influence. Yeah, uh, well, my eldest sister, Arjuman, was somehow, because girls were allowed to do, I think, such things, she, she was doing fine arts. And uh, that was, I think, in her intermediate. But Anna Molka used to teach there in Lahore College at that time. She also used to go there, although she was in the university, basically. But she would take classes there as well, and also in Al Alhambra. So uh, you know, she used to make drawings, life drawings. And I would be fascinated when I would look at them, you know, and I would try to copy. And sometimes I would think, yeah, I have made as good as her, you know. <laughs> so uh, that interest was somehow there, but nobody was really noticing me in my, you know, uh, brothers and sisters. We were, um, we were doing all sorts of things together. Sometimes we made, for, for instance, uh, we created a, a magazine on our own and wrote uh, different short stories in it and make, made some cartoons in it and illustrations and tried to write some, somebody's writing poetry and then we made a, a kind of, you know, we bound it together and made a magazine out of it. Because at that time in our house actually a lot of uh, literary magazines used to come. My mother was very much interested in reading and my father was also. So we would have uh, Nakush and we would have Although we were not allowed to read them, there was a magazine at the time called Naqad, and there was another one which was called Ruman, and then there was Shama, and you know, all sorts of magazines used to uh, come to our house. Although we were not really very uh, well off uh, financially, um, but these things were there. So, uh, but not really, I mean, uh, as such, I had not the opportunity of meeting a very uh, renowned artist or being in the company of a great poet or uh, great scholars or something like that. I completely missed on it. Uh, I wanted to read a, a, a poem that I wrote about the school, but that is going to be in Urdu if you, sure, if sure. you allow me here. Yeah. Um, I don't remember it by heart, but I'll see that I can. Mere mohalle se aage, johar ke kinare 
उड़ती मिट्टी के पीछे एक मकतब था हम जिसमें सहदम लंबी कतारें बांध के बाहर दुआ न तराना और नमाज पढ़ा करते थे और फिर बुझी हुई आंखों बोझल पैरों पर वापस चलकर खुद से भारी बस्ते अपनी कमर पे ला दे जल्दी जल्दी अपनी क्लास में आ जाते थे टाट झाड़ कर खूब स्लेट को चमकाकर उस्ताद का हुक्का भरकर पढ़ने बैठते थे और रटे हुए इसबाक की बाजी खेलने की कोशिश करते थे हम सब में से एक को भी मालूम नहीं था लब पे दुआएं बन के तमन्ना कब आती है क्यों आती है ब्लैक बोर्ड पर लिखे तिरस्माती अल्फाज का सूजे हाथों के पोरों से क्या रिश्ता है जोए जाफ़ल आदे आज़म बाग का रकबा 230 सौ तीस बटा इकतालीस ये सब क्या है सांस गले में क्यों फंसते हैं उंगलियां काली क्यों रहती हैं मेहरबान उस्ताद के आगे घुटने कांपने क्यों लगते हैं उम्र कटी पर हरफ तमन्ना और लबों में बोध वही है लोगों और हिंसों का खौफ अभी तक सीने पर बैठा है अफसर की ताज़ीम में आंखें झुकी हुई हैं गर्दन खम है दिल बागी है बख्त स्या है दिस इज वन ऑफ द पोइम्स अबाउट द एजुकेशन इन माय स्कूल so what made you switch from i mean we all know that you you were you were an actor and uh, performed in um, this 90 or like many performances um so uh, what made you switch from performing um in the and or being in the media to academia no actually uh, academia came first because when i qualified from the university Uh, fortunately or unfortunately i had very good position and uh, anna molka who used to be our teacher she said that instead of doing any private job you should start teaching and i was uh, interested in teaching even at that time because i remember that in my final year class i used to just you know just pretend to be a teacher and i would say everybody said and i'm you know going to teach you history of art or something like that so uh i was interested in it and i said okay and so i i joined very early because i had because of this early education not being in the school mm-hmm. i had i had done my classes rather early so uh when i did my masters i remember i was not even 21 and when i started teaching in the university of punjab as a full time lecturer I had still not reached my 21st birthday. You must look like a I student. Was, <laughs> yes. Right? <laughs> Then um, uh, of course I was teaching my juniors who were there <laughs> and they we were all very friendly and so it was like like you know good friends. But um that that came first that teaching part was the first thing. Now uh, later on I went to Nairobi and I I started teaching in Nairobi University I taught there for 8 years I was the head of the design department for a while <coughs> and over there my, my acting career actually started there on the stage because there were a lot of people who were interested in uh, Urdu or Punjabi theater or Punjabi and Urdu culture uh, who were who had settled there and who used to miss this part very much so we made a group of uh, uh, theater called natak in which there were some hindus six muslims all all the community was there and we would write plays and design things and act there and you know acting direction set design everything i have gone through uh, over there and we did some very serious and very good plays some uh, by serious i mean of a good standard so uh, my acting career kind of uh, started from there and then when i came back then i went to the television but in the beginning i didn't go there as a, as a as an actor i was uh, doing a program which was a uh, current affairs program it was called uh, hafta e rafta it was about the past week the whole uh, current affairs the past week 
and uh, I did that for two, three years continuously. But that was not something I, I, my, I was not really very, not very interested in that. I used to tell them, yeah, I, I'm more interested in singing, so why don't you give me that? And they would say, no, 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 you, you have to do this. Later on, I learned that because at that time, the government was uh, Ziaul Haq, General, Zia, General Ziaul Haq, and he used to watch the television programs. And once, perhaps just like that, watching that program, he, he must have, because he used to communicate also, so he must have written a note saying that this, uh, anchor or whatever is good and the other one is not that good so after that whenever I would say that I don't want to do it the producer would say no 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 sir you have to do it nobody else I mean, you have to do it and I used to wonder yeah people say that you know these producers don't give any lift to anyone and they their poor fellows are after me for nothing and what is it what is going on when Ziaul Haq's government finished and people's parties uh, took over, then somebody called me from the PTV and they said, uh, Sir, you have been blacklisted by the new government. Oh. I said, I've been blacklisted for what? what? <laughs> because I was never in favor of General Ziaul Haq. And, uh, but they said, by, because in your file, you know, yeah. there, there were some praises uh, about, about you written by General Jawalak, so they thought that you were his kind of special person. So I said, yeah, forget it. I wanted to leave this in any anyway, case. I said, yeah. <laughs> Thank God. Yes. Thank God. Yes. <laughs> Liberty. <laughs> so uh, acting career started a bit later. Uh, but I was into uh, singing at one time uh, a lot. And uh, not really as a professional singer, but as, as somebody who would because I had not really learned it as, as such, but just on my natural talent or something. So um, there was a time, I think about 20 years ago, when people in Lahore knew me more as a singer than anything else. And they, I want you to talk about it. They didn't it. know that I, <laughs> I was a painter or... Oh. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so, so what about your singing and what kind of... Uh, productions have you made? What are you more inclined towards? Uh, well, uh, I was I was more interested at that time and have always been actually uh, in in the music of the what we call the new theatre, which was uh, you may not even have heard heard about it, which was uh, uh, Segal. Pankaj Malik, Jag Mohan, and of course Mukesh and these people joined much later, Talat and these people. But um, basically the old songs. And uh, because myself and my younger brother Sharyar were very much in interested in music. And we remembered thousands of songs. I mean, they, any song you would think of, we could sing. And we, we had an ear for it that once you, we would hear any song, and then we were able to kind of reproduce it. Uh, that was something, something natural. So, um, but later on, I, I did make an attempt in composing some of my own poetry and some of my own uh, what you call geet or songs and uh, I wrote them and then I made music for it and there was an album which I released sometime long time back. Yes. And what were those geets about mostly? They love songs of oh, course. Oh okay, yeah. love songs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about your paintings? Um, what kind of art do, yes, uh, basically yeah, I was, I was yeah. trained as a graphic designer Okay. Um, because I wanted to take a painting but my teacher Adam Olka did not allow me at that time um, because she said, okay, you, you are a, a, a man and you are going to starve, what are you going to do all your life? Because at that time the painters were really in a bad way financially. So um, she forced me kind of to go into uh, graphic design. But I continued on my own, you know, um, 
doing sculpture and painting on my own. I just uh, went ahead and then, of course, I was at, at one time I did some uh, work for advertising, a lot of work for advertising also in an advertising agency. Um, as a creative director, I would write uh, the themes and also, you know, visualize uh, for them. But uh, I, I gave it up and I just then concentrated on painting mostly. Uh, in the beginning, my painting, like my early poetry, was also more uh, about social issues, uh, about the plight of women or about what is happening in Bosnia or in Pakistan or political, it was mostly political in nature. Um, later on, uh, I became more interested in portrait, portrait painting. And that was, that became kind of my genre uh, of work. But I've done some watercolors and all, all sorts of work actually. And you still do this? Yes. You still paint? Oh, yeah, I do, and of sing. course. That is a, well, singing is a bit um, rusty now, because <laughs> I uh, ask with you age. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how is working with uh, media different from academia? And what nourished you more? And why do you think so? Well, both have their own charm, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with the media is that, especially acting, if you're talking about acting, um, because if I've, I've worked as a, as a kind of, a, what do you call it, voiceover person, doing recording for my voice, and you know, that's a different, I think, genre altogether. But as an actor, uh, the only problem that I faced was that uh, actors are supposed to uh, go there to the, to the site or wherever where acting is to be shot uh, and sit there almost the whole day. You know, people sell, sell their day to them. And I feel very uh, uncomfortable when I have to just sit there wait for my shot and and acting in 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 this uh, drama business it's very difficult to manage time by the director or whoever is there because sometimes you're taking one scene and the scene takes much longer than expected it always takes longer than expected mm -hmm. as a matter of fact so um, your turn may come much later than it was calculated and they also cannot rely on this fact that at the same moment they would say, okay, at five o'clock you're supposed to be here and the person comes at five because then if he doesn't come, there will be problems. So you're supposed to come much earlier. You're, and I used to wonder, I used to ask this, some of the very senior people who were there acting with me, Yar, how do you, I mean, how do you do this? And because you're know, just sitting there and waiting and they said, why we are not bothered about that, you know, we, they charge, we charge on daily basis. So, when I have said I'll come for so many days, then from 9 to whatever, 9 to 9, let's say, or 9 to 12 at night, I have given this time to them. They want one shot, fine. They want 10 shots, fine. No problem. You know, I'm there. So, I find, I, I, I find that a bit disturbing, although I really enjoy, I really enjoy the work and, uh, but this part of wastage of time mm -hmm. is something, although sometimes I read there, but you know, it then looks odd that, you know, one person who's not communicating with anyone, other people are enjoying talking to each other or something, and one person is sitting and uh, is mm -hmm. pretending to read and <laughs> as if he's something very special. Okay. So that looks also, you know, odd. So that, that is the only th hitch which I, I think in acting I, I faced. Otherwise, it is something very, very interesting. And uh, of course, people recognize you much more if you are an actor than if you were a painter. Because as a painter, perhaps, you know, nobody looks at you or says, 
uh, hello, hi, or anything of that sort. <laughs> People don't even know you. But sometimes if you have done a play recently and you just going through a mall or something, everybody, you know, <laughs> uh, can I have a picture with you? Can I have a selfie? So it is kind of, it is interesting also that way. Yeah. Hmm. I see there is, there is, you, you have very diverse interests and and it's yes. kind of hard to, you know, Actually, balance. Actually, po poetry things. is something which is very, very close to my heart. Okay. And I have, I mean, I have done a lot of work in poetry. Right. Three of my books have been published, but there are at least five or six which are complete and which need to be published right now, which, which I have done. I have written for children. I have written... Um, for, for preschool children, for more senior children. I have written for, uh, I have translated from English to Urdu poetry. I have translated the work of Tagore into poetry. I have, I have uh, tried to, I tried to do some translation of the last 30th Sipara of Quran and make, make it into a poetic kind of a translation. Although I don't want to really bring it to public, some people may hang me for it. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is going Facebook Live. <laughs> but uh, I've tried to be as close to the, right, the, the, to, to the meaning as possible. So, um, uh, and, and about Lahore, I have written uh, a lot of poems. So, um, we'd like to hear some of your poetry. Yes. Um, you sure uh, I refer to the did, did this uh, poetry about uh, Lahore, let's say, or this also relates to my childhood in a way. Hamare ghar mein ek jadu ka zina tha. Jo lattu ki tarah se ghoomta tha aur meri sochon ke chauthe asma par ja ke khulta tha. ये तंगो तार और सादा सा रास्ता मेरी यादों की किताबों में बड़ा रोशन कुशादा और पुरस्कार लिखा है पतंगे हाथ में लेकर कभी मैं इसके ऊंचे पायदा फलांगता छत पर पहुंचकर सांस लेता और कभी इस पर तुम्हारे सुरमई आंचल का कोना थाम के रुक रुक के ऐसे पांव रखता था कि जैसे वक्त सांसों में अटकता हो इसी जीने के नीचे खाली हिस्से में हमारा ठंडे पानी का ट्यूब वेल था जहां पर सख्त गर्मी के दिनों में भी नहाने से हर एक की गिग्घी बन जाती थी तब शायद जमी का सीना यूं तपता नहीं था या वो सचमुच पीर घोड़े शाह साहब की करामत थी खुदा जाने यहां दीवार की गोलाई में जो रोशनी के चाक थे उनसे तुम्हारी छत नजर आती थी और दालान का कोना मैं पैरों तक यहां बैठा तुम्हारी एक झलक का मुंतजर रहता जहां तुम सामने आती मैं सीढ़ी के घुबन घेरियों पर बैठकर सीधा सितारों की तरफ परवास कर जाता दिस इज समथिंग अबाउट या एक इस a little disturbing noise is there, but yeah. never mind. There is um, a poem about, um, it's called Darkhast, uh, a request. Taluk is tarah toda nahi karte ke phir se jodna dushwar ho jaye. Taluk is tarah toda nahi karte ke phir se jodna dushwar ho jaye. हयात एक जहर में डूबी हुई तलवार हो जाए मोहब्बत इस तरह छोड़ा नहीं करते खफा होने की रस्में हैं बिगड़ने के तरीके हैं रिवाज और रस्में तरके दोस्ती पर सौ किताबें हैं रवादारी का ऐसे रास्ता छोड़ा नहीं करते ताल्लुक इस तरह तोड़ा नहीं करते कभी बुलबुल गुलों की खामोशी से रूठ जाती है पर अगले साल सब कुछ भूलकर फिर लौट आती है अगर पौधों से पानी दूर हो जाए 
تو ہم سایہ درختوں کی جڑوں کے ہاتھ پیغامات جاتے ہیں محبت پہ سبھی ایک دوسرے کو آزماتے ہیں مگر ایسا نہیں کرتے کہ ہر امید ہر امکان مٹ جائے کہاں تک کھینچنی ہے ڈور یہ اندازہ رکھتے ہیں ہمیشہ چار دیواری میں ایک دروازہ رکھتے ہیں جدائی مستقل ہو جائے تو یہ زندگی زندان ہو جائے اگر خوشبو ہواؤں سے مراسم منقطع کر لے تو خود میں ڈوب کر بے جان ہو جائے سنو جینے سے منہ موڑا نہیں کرتے محبت اس طرح چھوڑا نہیں کرتے ایک نظم ہے اس کالڈ ترک تعلق اٹس کائنڈ آف سیکول ٹو دی فرسٹ ون این وے ہمارے درمیان کچھ چیز رہنے دو ہمارے درمیان کچھ چیز رہنے دو کوئی در کھٹ کھٹانے کو کوئی دیوار گرنے کو کوئی کوسار ہٹنے کو کوئی امید مرنے کو کوئی وعدہ کوئی دعویٰ پرکھنے آزمانے کو ستانے کو ہمارے درمیان کچھ چیز رہنے دو اور کنارے ہی صحیح دونوں مگر ایک بیچ میں دریا تو بہنے دو ہمارے درمیان کچھ چیز رہنے دو اگر کچھ بھی نہیں ہوگا تو میں کچھ بھی نہیں سے کیا بناؤں گا کہاں اٹکاؤں گا سانسیں تمہاری یاد کس کھوٹی پہ ٹانگوں گا ہوا کے ہاتھ پر لکھ کر نہیں جاؤ ہوا تو سب مٹا دے گی بھلا دے گی ہماری داستان اوروں کو کہنے دو ہمارے درمیان کچھ چیز رہنے دو سنا ہے دشمنی بھی ایک تعلق ہے تو یہ تلوار ہی کھینچو ادھر ایک زخم ہی پھینکو کوئی جھنکار کی آواز آئے چیخ ابھرے درد ٹھہرے خون بہنے دو ہمارے درمیان کچھ چیز رہنے دو Anyway, so um, as a person from, you know, the art and acting and media, um, who are your inspirations? Mm. Well, I think in poetry, like Fez, uh, very much, although I don't write, write like him and Ahmad Adim Qasmi was very kind and very close to me um, before he passed away and um, of course Ghalib was supposed to be you know, the master of all times. I think there cannot be a poet who has not really benefited from his diction and his style uh, without doubt. And, In Ghazal, I think Faraz was absolutely fantastic because Ghazal basically is supposed to be something which uh, can be sung, you know. And he was amazing in that, creating, staying with this tradition and at the same time creating something new. Uh, or amongst the, uh, those who are living now, Abbas Tabish, for instance, is a very good ghazal uh, poet in Pakistan. There's so many of uh, these people uh, that I owe a lot to because really until and unless you read a lot, you cannot write, it's not possible. And I have I mean, almost read everyone and uh, every, everyone has uh, influenced me in some way or the other. I think one thing good about uh, Um, one thing which is necessary for, for creativity is that you should have a short memory. Mm. That you should not really have a very uh, long-term 
memory because you read something, then you forget it. And if you forget it, then it's sometimes, you know, it gets absorbed in your system. And when it comes out, it comes out as something new, different than your own original work. If you remember, if, you're, if, you, if you've got a very good memory, then you remember everything and sometimes you tend to repeat it, which is, which is not a good thing. Um, and I have a very bad memory. Great. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Alarmingly bad, actually. <laughs> That's why you were like, tell me a day before that I have this event. <laughs> yes, I told you. That you will have to remind me, otherwise I'll, I'll just forget it. Sometimes I've gone to occasions where, you know, it was yesterday and I, I've gone oh. the next day and I see nobody there. And sometimes a day earlier and it's <laughs> been very embarrassing situations I've faced because of that. Never mind. Um, how do you see poetry or uh, literature and art in general evolve over time? Well, I think arts of, are finding their place in Pakistan, particularly. There was a time when artist, the image of the artist was someone who's uh, dirty, with long hair and, and a beard which is going haywire. Like uh, a philosopher. Yeah, yeah, like a philosopher and doesn't know anything about his clothes and he's got a broken shoe and all that. But uh, and it used to happen also, but things have changed now. A lot of people have become quite successful in, in their endeavors and financially also they have uh, made money. So uh, basically the society has recognized to some extent, although not really fully, I would say, uh, the value of the arts. Otherwise you would, I think, about 30, 40 years ago, you would go to somebody's house, you would hardly see a painting there. You, know, you would maybe see a photograph or some calligraphy or something like that at the most. I'm not saying that calligraphy is not art. I think calligraphy is absolutely, um, it can be absolutely amazing and uh, almost something which is sent from God because the excellence that is required for that is, uh, I really admire that. But art has its own, uh, you know, importance. Uh, I think the difference between a painting and a photograph, for instance, is that if you go to a photographic exhibition <coughs> without really being, uh, uh, I mean, if the, prof I'm not talking about professional photographers who are very good. Uh, they would, I hope they will forgive me when I say that, <laughs> that when you go to an exhibition of photographs, you would just, you know, just see, 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 you pass. Hardly any picture would have that power to hold you there for a considerable period of time because they're, they're there, you know, you can recognize them and they're, but any painting, I think, comparatively has got more holding power. They, they, you can discover something new, different all the time in it. The strokes, the way the color is applied, the texture, the, the whole composition. I mean, you always can discover something different and new and it has the power to hold your interest. There are people who just, you know, you, you go to an art gallery internationally somewhere, which is, and see some work, you, you just want to get lost there and stand there and you, you could stand there for, for all your life, <laughs> almost, if, if your legs would allow it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think art has got tremendous power. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, where, where language, philosophy, psychology ends is where art begins. Yes. So, but language has its own, um, its own. Um, excellence and... I think we have, we are kind of losing this value of something well said. 
we are just becoming careless about our expression. We are, we're, we're not really bothered anymore, particularly our younger generation and what we are seeing on the television. It's so pathetic, people fighting with each other and arguing and not accepting any, anybody is not able to accept any, and there's no such thing as truth. I mean, one person is saying something, the other person is saying just the opposite, as convincingly then, you know, and they are at, uh, at war with each other constantly and sometimes very rude to each other. And I think this is going to affect our generations. And we are losing the value of saying something decently, saying something in the minimum possible way, because that is what poetry is. Poetry is saying something with a certain rhythm and uh, maybe the thing can, can be very ordinary that you, you are saying. Dile naadan tujhe hua kya hai? Aakhir is dard ki dawa kya hai? If you just look at the meaning, oh my stupid heart, what has happened to you? And what is the uh, medicine. medicine or cure for this disease? <coughs> but sorry, this is of course not what is meant. What is, tujhe kya hua hai? There is a difference between tujhe kya hua hai and tujhe hua kya hai. You know, that, that finesse of it. Tujhe hua kya hai means that you have asked this question a million times before also. You know, it's not just saying tujhe kya hua hai. Tujhe hua kya hai. What the hell is wrong with you? I mean, without really saying this bad word of hell, what's hell. But in a very decent way saying tujhe hua kya hai. Or, and then why, when you say Dile Nadan, then there's a whole story behind it. Why is that Dil Dile Nadan? What Nadani has it done? You know, there's a whole story which is at the back somewhere. And Akhir is Dard ki Dawa kya hai? And the spontaneity of it and the beauty of the way the words are knitted together and you know, the way they are fitted into this small behar or small uh, meter. That is something amazing for someone who can appreciate it. And I think we should be able to do that. You, and, and you can't translate <coughs> that experience. I mean, poetry at some level is about experiencing yes. the linguistic of those words, how they're knotted together. And that in itself is an art. Yes, and because you, you, cannot, you cannot just describe the meaning and hope that uh, you understand the poetry. Because meaning, it's, it's like taking, uh, taking a rose and in order to explain the beauty of the rose, you pluck every petal. You pluck the petals and you say, this is the beauty of the rose. The rose will not be left anymore, you know. So if you take a, <coughs> a, a piece of poetry or a share and then you dissect it, there's hardly anything left in it anymore. <laughs> It's in a context. Yes. Right? Um, I want to also talk about your experience uh, in Punjab, University of Punjab and Comsats and now at the Institute of Art and Culture. How that has evolved and what have you contributed in terms of uh, the literary work in art? Well, uh, as a teacher, I've tried to do my best and I think that um, basically, a teacher should be able to communicate well with the students um, in any language, of course. Perhaps in Urdu I can communicate much better than I'm doing right now. Yes, I'm sure. But, um, um, and, and, and the skills and whatever you have to teach, of course, that, that is there and the ideas. I think the good, the good thing about teaching art is, that you are never repeating yourself. If you are teaching, let's say, history or geography or mathematics, then one year you are teaching one class something, the next year the same thing, the next year the same thing. You know, there is a syllabus, there is a curriculum, you are according to that, you go to the class and you teach the same thing over and over and after some time you become, of course, an expert in it and you have no problem and you are supposed to be a great professor. 
But in art, every time a new problem, every time a new challenge is brought by the student, you know, for, for discussion. And that is the beauty of it, that you're never repeating anything. You know, you don't have to repeat anything. Every time you're learning a lot, because, because something which is being presented to you for criticism or anything is so different and so unique, you have not seen it before. So your own development is also taking place. It's not just something that you're teaching. Because I think you cannot teach after teaching uh, for so many years, I've realized that you can learn. It's possible to learn, but it's not possible to teach. Because if you go to a class and you start describing all the fantastic things that you have learned in your life and all the secrets of your success and the secrets of your being a great artist and all that, and you put them there and make a list of it and describe it and tell people, by the time they go out of the class, they would have learned nothing. But if somebody is struggling and trying to find on her own or on his own mm. some, some, some problem is, and faces a problem and comes to you, and you give even just a little indication and say, just look at it like this, you know, it can open hundreds of doors for you, for a searching mind, for somebody who wants to learn. So these days, I think we have to put the responsibility of learning primarily on the learner. That is the most important thing which we don't do. We are following still a system which is teacher based. Teacher is supposed to be the one who is going to deliver the knowledge to the, to the class. A teacher cannot deliver the knowledge because his knowledge is going to be limited no matter how great he is. So it's, it's not basically a delivery system as such. It's a system of discovery. And every student must discover for herself what, what she has to do. I give you an example of that, if, if, if I'm not boring you. And that is, um, when I used to sing at that time, uh, because I had not really taken any formal training for it. So sometimes with a complex tal of a tabla, uh, especially in semi-classical or you know, free singing kind of a situation, I would go offbeat because you know, there are some tals, there are some rhythms which are easy and the, some rhythms which are very complex. So one of my friends, who is also my colleague, and he also keeps hearing these lectures of mine about being self-learning and all that. I asked him, I said, yeah, what is this? You have been my friend for such a long time and you can play such fantastic tabla, but you have never taught me anything. What the hell is this? And he laughed and he said, sir, actually you never wanted to learn. And I mean, he, he returned the same thing that I used to say. And I realized that it's absolutely true. If I really wanted to learn tabla, I would have done something about it. I would have somehow, you know, would have learned it if I was really serious about it. But I wasn't. I was just superficially thinking that I should know it. You know, somebody would teach me. Our students are constantly, I have to really hammer it in their heads, you know, that you, I'm you, don't, teach you. Don't, don't rely on, on the teacher and don't think that the teacher is going to give you something, you know. And we still keep on believing this and we keep on saying, we have not been taught, we have not been told, this thing was out of course, this thing was that, you know, nobody taught us. The teacher never came to class or something like that. We are always putting the blame of our not knowing something on someone else or saying that my family was backward, my father was not educated, my mother was not educated, I was in a bad school, what could I do? I'm like this because of this. But actually, it's all totally wrong. We're just in a habit of putting 
out the blame on someone else for our shortcomings. And also being lazy. Yes, of course. And not, not really, I mean, you, you go to the college or you go to the university, but you're not going for learning something. You're going for a piece of paper. You're going for a degree. You, you want to get that piece of paper. That's all there is. And you're concerned about your marks and things like that, which are ridiculous. I mean, what is marks going to do? Uh, what, 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 what do they have to do with, with your ability to learn? Nothing. Actually, if your failure teaches you, you know, and we, we never realize that. We condemn the student who fails right from the childhood. If a student fails in something, we give a punishment or become very angry or disappointed and all that. We never realize that you cannot learn unless you fail. You have to just teach them that from your failure, just find out what went wrong. How did you fail? What were your mistakes? And try to do better next time. But we never do that. We get angry. We, we you know, get out of our head and we just make the student also feel inferior and not able to do anything. I think uh, in many ways you're a hero for the nation and provided the contribution you have made to the country and you have been fairly awarded for that. Um, what is one thing that you would like to say to the youth today? Uh, <laughs> I would like to say that I think that every human being has been given something special by God. Everyone has got some special ability. We have to discover what special ability we have been given. Maybe I'm given the ability to be a good mountaineer, to do mountaineering, and I'm going, trying to become a doctor or something like that, you know. You have to discover what, what you're born with, what is your talent. Discover that and then follow that as, as your profession in life. Because then you will never feel that you're working or you're tired or you're sick or, you know, you are doing something that you love. You got to do something that you love and love what you do. Yeah. That is right. Um, I don't know how the audience would feel about it, but I want to listen to one last piece of your poetry and then we will end the talk. <laughs> sure, okay, let me, let me just see what should I should narrate. Uh, this nazm is called Main Kuch Bhi Nahi. I'm nothing. Agar Main Daakiya Hota Agar Main Daakiya Hota Hawa Ke Haath Se Likhe Huwe Phoolon Ke Khat Le Kar Tumhare Ghar Pohan Jata Agar Main Daakiya Hota Hawa Ke Haath Se Likhe Huwe Phoolon Ke Khat Le Kar Tumhare Ghar Pohan Jata Julaha Main Agar Hota तो खड्डी पर तुम्हारी सांस से चादर बना लेता अगर मैं बागबां होता गुजरते बादलों के हाथ से छागल पकड़कर सूखते पौधों के पैरों में उलट देता सिपाही मैं अगर होता तो बच्चों का तबस्सुम जमा करके दुश्मनों की फौज को मغلوب कर देता अगर मैं मिस्त्री होता तो सच्चे प्यार की बुनियाद पर रोशन ख्याली का जहां तामीर कर देता अगर मैं मास्टर होता तो काली रात के तख्ते स्याह को मैं तुम्हारा नाम लिख लिख कर सफेदी में बदल देता मगर इसका अनुमान है कि मगर मैं कुछ भी नहीं एक आखिरी नज़म अगर आपकी इजाज़त हो तो 
استاد شوکت حسین خان ہمارے ایک بہت بڑے استاد تھے میوزک کے تبلے کے حوالے سے یعنی لاٹ آف گریٹ پیپل ہو ڈن تبلہ اینڈ میڈ اے نیم فار دیم سیلس آر ہی اسٹوڈنٹس بٹ ہی از پاسٹ وے ان کے لیے میں نے ایک نظم لکھی تھی جب رقص کیا ایٹم نے جب دل نے دھڑکنا سیکھا جب خاک میں جنبش آئی جب پھول نے کھلنا سیکھا جب خالق نے بے ترتیبی کے امکان سے ترتیب چنی ہر شے کو ایک آہنگ دیا موسیقی کا آغاز ہوا دھا ٹٹکٹ تننا کتا دھا ٹٹکٹ تننا کتا پھر اس نے زمین بچھائی کوہساروں کی میخیں گاڑی ہر شے جوڑے میں بنائی دن جد و جہد کی خاطر اور شب کو سکون جسم و قلب کے نادر لمحے بخشے دھاگے دھاگے گے گے گھے دھاگے دھاگے گے گے گھے موسیقی ہے باد صبا میں موسیقی آب بقا میں ہر چیز میں موسیقی ہے موسیقی روح خدا میں موسیقی جیسے ہوا درختوں سے قصے کہتی ہو موسیقی جیسے گھاس ستاروں سے باتیں کرتی ہو موسیقی جیسے سپنوں کی چھت پر بوندیں گرتی ہوں موسیقی جیسے جادو نگری میں پریاں چلتی ہوں ٹٹکٹ ٹٹکٹ تاگے نہ ٹٹکٹ ٹٹکٹ تاگے نہ اے شوکت حسن سماعت اے نوبت امن و محبت اے رہ رو راہ سنگت اے لے کے مہا استاد تیرا فیضان و سخاوت دنیا کے ہر ایک گوشے میں جب تک سنگیت ہے باقی جب تک یہ جہاں قائم ہے ہر شام ہے تیری شام ہر دن ہے تیرا دن کر دن تھینک یو سو مچ فار بینگ آر گیسٹ اینڈ آئی لائک ٹو تھینک ایوری بڈی ایلس از ویل فار بینگ ہیئر اینڈ یو جسٹ کیرنگ ٹوگیدر نوئنگ شاہ نواز زیدی ایز ہی از ان ہیز in his own voice and terminology. Um, I hope to see you uh, on our next shows. We will be hosting other guests uh, in the upcoming months. Um, and if you're interested, please sign up for My Voice Unheard on Facebook and we'll keep you posted with the events. Great. Thank you so much.